Hello, 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 and welcome to another DM25 live stream where we feature progressive ideas you won't hear anywhere else. I'm Eric Edmund, coming to you with my best Meron Khalili impersonation, for whom I'm standing in tonight, uh, on this rather bleak topic for today's live stream agenda. More and more, we are living, as the apocryphal Chinese curse would uh, put it, in interesting times. Several latent conflicts have resurfaced. In Gaza, Israel's relentless bombardment of innocent civilians is entering its seventh horrendous week and has put the entire region once again on the war footing. In Ukraine, the fight against Russia, which has also given the NATO military bloc renewed relevance and power, is descending to a violent, bloody stalemate. These conflicts are testing traditional geopolitical alliances while also bringing about new ones. Because this century has seen major shifts in world power. On the one hand, we've got the BRICS, which are experiencing a surge in membership interest and indeed, indeed actual membership participation, as China, Russia, and India have grown stronger and more relevant and influential in the world stage, uh, while Iran has, since the Trump administration, decoupled from shy Western attempts at cooperation. Then, just this Sunday in Argentina, the election of Javier Milei, a self-styled anarcho-capitalist who ran on a platform of ultra-privatization and disbanding of multiple of the country's ministries, including those for education, environment, and culture, shows us the lengths we can anticipate capitalists to go to to save their collapsing world order. And of course, this all takes place in the foreground while our planet's collapsing ecosystem loops, lo looms large in the background. Is this the end of a world order and it being replaced by a new world disorder? Is this path unavoidable or do progressives still have a chance and can support some hope for real progressive change? Is this the best or the worst of times to go political? And what should Europe's play? drama. Our movement's coordinating team is sent to us in the chat and we will get to them as the evening progresses. So let's get cracking. We've got much ground to cover and we will start the evening with uh, Julia Moore from the UK. Julia, over to you. Thanks, Eric. Hello there. Good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, uh, uh, a challenging introduction by, by Eric there, um, but I would like to broaden out the, the view uh, for us here this evening and, and for wherever you're dialing in from and, and joining us. Um, on the 8th of November, uh, Progressive International, our sister organisation, which I'm sure many of you are aware, a uh, fantastic panel, uh, Yanis, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, joined by other uh, experts. I would urge viewers tonight to take a look at that and the words that obviously not only Yanis that we've heard here talk about the Middle East, but Jeremy Corbyn talking about the people power of protest and collective action. And he went through a fantastic list, historic list of where if you think that activism and being on the streets doesn't change structure, then uh, listen to that panel and specifically uh, Jeremy's historic list of the indirect and sometimes delayed and deferred success of people who protest in these huge numbers. And of course, the, the UK in 93, uh, under Jeremy's direction, uh, saw the biggest uh, protest, street protest, uh, historically, uh, between two and three million people against the Iraq uh, invasion at that time. And I would urge people, uh, maybe as a result of our session tonight, which is uh, understandably heavy and important, have a look at that because it is truly uplifting, truly inspiring, and really underpins everything that we do. If you think of our campaigns, get involved and uh, the call to collective action. And one of the panel uh, uh, also on, on that discussion was saying, of course, it's an antidote and it's an absolute balance to the uh, continued attempts uh, by home secretaries across Western Europe to control people meeting together. 
Now, we may not see the instant effects. We may have failures of an instant uh, nature of protests, but indirectly they change things. Of course, the Vietnam, Vietnam War, South Africa, of course, is, is the history success of that. So please, everybody, have a look at that. It's uplifting. It gives us hope and it puts in context, of course, the current horrors that we're dealing with without trivialising the fact that we have to remember we are talking about human beings suffering. And the specific, coming back to the Middle East, the specific second point I'd like everybody to, to be thinking about tonight is also taking a historic view of the Middle East. Um, as a British citizen, um, I was taught the uh, British establishment history version of the Balfour Declaration, the Sykes-Picot uh, delineation. And um, it's a fascinating journey to go back now with the lens of looking back at that history, seeing the parallels. And of course, people in the UK are witnessing the COVID inquiry at the moment, seeing how history repeats itself, learning from that, seeing that structures on the one hand appear to be the same, and yet we can change them, referencing what I've said before about protests and the, the indirect results of what, what happens when people are brought together. So uh, sort of a plea for a historic broad brush against the uh, immediate horrors that we're all trying to uh, ameliorate. Thanks, Eric. Uh, so, thank you. <laughs> Excuse thank me. Thank you for that. Thanks, Eric. Eric. Bless you. And uh, thank you for that <laughs> more helpful brush stroke. Uh, we're moving on now to Yanis. Yanis Varoufakis is coming to us from Athens, our co-founder and head of our Greek political party, Mela 25. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you all who have joined us in the live stream or those of you who will be watching us canned through YouTube. Uh, I'm going to start with um, a holistic approach to what's happening in Ukraine and Gaza. Because DiEM25, from the first moment, Putin's troops crossed the border and invaded Ukraine. We were very, very clear, and in a way which I think throws important light on uh, what a civilized approach to uh, latent and um, And on the opposite side of the invader, whoever happens to be the invader and whoever happens to be the invaded. We said back then, February 2022, that in the same way that we support and we are on the side and we stand with Palestinians whose homes are invaded by the settlers, whose land is taken over by the IDF, the Israeli army, we are standing with Ukraine given Putin's invasion. We do not care what Putin's reasons for invading are. We do not care whether he was provoked or not. He was provoked, there's no doubt. But it doesn't matter. When you violate international law by invading, whatever your reasons are, you violate international law and you're an invader and we're going to stand against you. It doesn't matter whether Israel was provoked by Hamas. Israel has been violating international law, flouting international law, and occupying territory that it has no right to occupy. So it doesn't matter what provoked this Israeli incursion. When Vladimir Putin's troops, air force, army, um, cannons, when they flattened a hospital in Mariupol, or blocks of flats in various cities, from Kharkiv, sometimes even Kiev, certainly Mariupol. We called Putin a war criminal for doing that. When Israel did the same, and much, much worse in Gaza, in terms of the quantity of the shelling and the number of lives, especially children whose lives were lost. Don't forget that in the last six weeks in Gaza, more children have died than in the last five years around the world in any war or skirmish. 
close the parenthesis. Well, when Israel did the same, in, a, in the same way we called out Putin for um, bombing and taking out hospitals, theaters, and so on in Mariupol, we did the same thing when Israel did it. DiEM25 is consistent, ethically consistent, legally consistent, politically consistent, unlike the, you know, the European Union and, of course, the United States. For whom? For the European Union and the United States. War crimes committed by Putin are hideous war crimes. But when committed by Israel, suddenly they become metamorphosed into legitimate self-defense. The West rightly rejects Putin's claim of staging a special operation. Not a war, not an invasion, but a special operation in Ukraine. That's correct. It's not a special operation. It is now an out invasion. When he says that he's doing it to denazify Ukraine, even though there are Nazis in Ukraine, as we know that, the Azov Brigade are a Nazi brigade. But we laugh in Putin's face when he says that his invasion is justified because he's denazifying Ukraine. In that exact same way, we laugh in the face of Israel and we condemn Israel when it is claiming to be denazifying Gaza by bombarding the, you know, a whole population to smithereens. Similarly, for the way forward, uh, dim 25s policies and recommendations um, are the only consistent ones. What are we saying in Ukraine and in the Middle East, in Israel-Palestine? Negotiated peace now. Ceasefire and a negotiated peace. A just compromise is the only thing that can end an endless war. That it can end war crimes. In Israel-Palestine and in the Ukraine. In the case of Ukraine, the West backs a forever war based on the argument that any concession to Russia is beyond the pale, whether it is to keep Ukraine neutral, not a member of NATO, no, no deal with Putin. When there is a discussion about Crimea being kicked into the long grass so the United Nations can deliberate about this on the next 20 years, no way, no land for peace, no Crimea for peace is the standard Western line. War until the aggressor falls, right? As if Putin is going to fall. But anyway, in sharp contrast, when the West talks to the Palestinians, what does it say? Land for peace. Give up the tiny slivers of land that you, <laughs> that you were, uh, that, that were left to you um, after 1967. Give half of them up. Um, Condemn yourselves to be living in no viable living Bantustans, like South African apartheid was condemning or trying to uh, confine the black population in these Bantustans, for peace. What the West probably doesn't realize is that it's Kalu's support for Israel's war crimes. It is double standards when it comes to, on the one hand, the Palestinians, on the other hand, the Ukrainians. They achieve through these double standards and this hypocrisy two things. The first thing that they achieve is that they make a mockery of the West's condemnation of Putin. The second thing, they cause the rest of the world never to take the West's claims for caring for human rights, for a rules-based international order, for international law. Nobody takes them seriously. Beyond the West's ludicrous double standards and its criminal support of Israel, the question becomes, what does this all mean in terms of geopolitics worldwide, everywhere? Well, I'm going to dismiss the thing of the BRICS as a solid block that is countering Western imperialism. The BRICS talk left, but walk right. Montes India is not a progressive force. It is not an anti-colonial force. Just ask the people of Kashmir, <laughs> or our comrades across the vast Indian country, nation. 
The fact that the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia are gravitating towards the BRICS, won't even want to become members of the BRICS, without ever leaving Washington and the United States and the dollar behind. This is not a victory. Huh? The gravitation of the United, United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia towards the BRICS is not a victory of anti-imperialism, comrades. It is not a victory of the decolonization movement. Think of the United Arab Emirates' support of the Sisi dictatorship in Egypt. Think of its support of the warlords in Libya. Think of Saudi Arabia's brutal colonization of Yemen and the crimes against humanity that they are uh, committing there. Tragically, the West support of Israel and the West double standards that I mentioned before emboldens everyone who wants to violate political rights and civil liberties in the developing world as well as international law. The worst progressives, we must realize that the enemy of our enemy may get stronger when our enemy loses credibility as the West is losing credibility today. But that does not make the enemy of our enemy our friend. The geopolitical game, as we speak, is mainly centered upon a major clash of what I call two digital cloud fiefdoms, cloud-based digital networks of cloud capital. One is Silicon Valley and Wall Street, the other is Chinese. The war in Ukraine and the confiscation of billions and billions and billions of Russian central bank money by the West, by the United States and the European Union, has made the Chinese cloud thief very attractive for people like Saudi Arabian princes, United Ar Emirat Arab Emirates, uh, Indonesians, Malaysians, and so on. Not just Russians. At the very same time, China remains a great hope for an advanced technological society. There is a bit in China, but there is a global experiment where we got from there and where progressive forces may very well spring out of the Chinese experiment. But when we, when we meet our Chinese friends, we seem to have lost Yanis. Yeah, but at the same time, ah. I pull no punches to, in criticizing the authoritarians within China, especially the Ruth this treatment of Hong Kong university students, the polytechnic students in particular. This is, I think, the right way of proceeding, both in terms of our analysis and our activities, as deemed at five, as the Progressive International. We have to steer a very fine course between supporting those who are opposing Western imperialism, settler colonialism, and at the same time, we must defend human rights, political rights, and basic international law on war crim crim crimes against those who are opposing the United States, but who do not respect those basic humanist principles, which we, the M25, have a duty to hold very dear to our hearts and to fight for. Thanks. Big thank you to Yanis Varoufakis, less so to his not very cooperative internet connection. Hopefully it will recover by the time he comes back to us. Um, now we continue with uh, Judith Meyer coming to us from Berlin, Germany. Uh, thank you, Eric. Um, as Yanis said, we condemn war crimes no matter who commits them. And we absolutely reject the idea that something is a war crime if so-called uncivilized countries do it, but it's not a war crime if the West does it. The West is not particularly civilized. 
But there are people who say that the whole concept has no sense, that war is cruel, that war crimes are inevitable, and we should grow up and accept that. Well, to me, it's clear that international law and the Geneva Conventions are inadequate. They're ignored a lot. They're used in specious ways to justify sometimes invasions in other uh, countries. But it does not follow for me that it is naive uh, to support international law and the Geneva Conventions. We should not just accept uh, that war is this way. Because what would happen if we were to accept that? If we just say, okay, it's law of the jungle, nobody cares. Well, I personally wouldn't start to commit massacres. I don't think anyone here would, but we'd have to stop criticizing them. We could no longer say that uh, this country um, made uh, did a crime by bombing a hospital uh, or by denying food uh, to civilians in uh, in Gaza or any of these things, it would be much harder to, to criticize. Uh, and the other side is if we do accept uh, and promote international law and the Geneva Conventions, even as inadequate as they are, um, it immediately becomes an improvement. Even if uh, a majority of people do not believe uh, in them, it would still lead to a net improvement because those people who do believe in them would not be committing uh, war crimes. They would probably stop some crimes from happening if they're embedded in military units uh, that would otherwise commit them. Uh, or if they can't stop them, they would become whistleblowers. We've seen this, uh, for example, with uh, the amazing video leaked uh, by WikiLeaks from the war in Afghanistan, where some American um, pilots fire on journalists. And it was another American, presumably, uh, who leaked this information so that we know about it. This can only happen if this person was convinced that gunning down journalists is wrong. So even if only one in a hundred person has this strong co conviction uh, that the Geneva Conventions are worth upholding, uh, we as humanity gain from this. And I believe that we should promote it uh, more and more and uh, convince people that it's absolutely not naive, but in fact, the reasonable and progressive thing to do uh, to uphold this belief, even if there will be a lot of people that don't believe it. The more people believe it, the harder it will be for any organized military to commit war crimes. And there will be more whistleblowers. Also, if we believe in a Star Trek-like future or any future where humanity has reached a new level, it's possible that war hasn't been completely abolished in this future, like the Federation still fights Klingons, but it's impossible to imagine that the future human civilization is fine with massacring civilians that are no threat to them. It's a primitive thing. It doesn't belong in an enlightened future. So seeing others go back to a more primitive uh, human understanding of what we should uh, No reason at all for ourselves to move backwards. Thank you. Thank you, you did. Um, before moving on to our next speaker, who will be Panos uh, Tenos from Athens, a couple of questions that are also relevant to what you was just referring to beyond the more philosophical and theoretical approach to rights. There's also the question posed by KP in our chat about the actual systems we have in place for enforcing those rights, um, namely the United Nations. And KP asks, how do we create a different United Nations as the one based in New York City controls entire the entire world and prevents the enforcement of laws? So what could potentially be a more practical and efficient and effective alternative to the United Nations? Or is there a way of reforming the current United Nations? That's something for our next speakers to keep in mind, please. And the second question comes from Claire, who asks us, isn't apartheid inherent in the state of Israel since it was conceived as a Jewish state, as the ultimate quintessential safe place for Jews from all over the world? So is the one state where Jews and Arabs have the same civil and political rights solution not completely impossible? So does the one state solution have um, a hope of ever being uh, implemented and become a reality? Those two questions to keep in mind. As
Hello. Thanks, Eric. And thank you, Judith, for uh, giving us a, a bit of a bright vision in this time of gloom. Um, so I take this opportunity to say that, uh, I mean, there are proposals, uh, there are policies tabled by um, the Progressive International and DiEM25 about a different world. We have proposed uh, a new non-aligned movement uh, without any military blocks um, in favor of collective but indivisible security and global cooperation that will lead to shared prosperity. And uh, to make that happen, there is also the project for the new international economic order. Um, and this is this is ongoing. So um, th there is a vision. There are ways to get there. Um, the question is, where are we now? And, uh, and, and, how, and how do we progress from here? In this um, world in transition, where uh, we should see where we are, we belong to the West. And we should first uh, recognize that the importance of the West is diminishing. Um, however, the West is still very dangerous for, for, for world peace and, uh, and security. Um, the way it looks to me right now, I mean, this familiar theme, U.S. power is receding, the economic and political center is moving to the east, um, and, and you have this, uh, this power system that is losing its, its grip over the, over the globe, and uh, it doesn't want to. Now, the problem for, for Western planners is that um, the U.S. and the West in general which let's remind ourselves, who is the West? The West is the US, Canada, the UK, the European Union, and then Australia, New Zealand, Japan, not even Singapore anymore, I think. Um, so as the West is losing its grip, it does not have many diplomatic options to actually uh, influence and control. Why? Because of the war on terror, because of US support for Israel, because of all, all the, 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 the foreign policy failures. On the other hand, China, that hasn't fired a shot for like 50 years and has the Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, when they go to Africa, the Africans say, when the Brits come, we get a lecture. When the Chinese come, we get a hospital or a university. Um, they have diplomatic capital. They promote peace. They promote cooperation. They promote trade. So um, we're already seeing that. Um, Countries across the world, when they do have, and Singapore is a case in point, when they do have a choice, uh, they will rather not take sides, which basically favors China. Um, but um, what I'm trying to get at is that um, the, the West does not have any diplomatic options, but they have many military options. Um, the US has hundreds of bases uh, around the world, and uh, it seems that they, they don't want to let go of, of, of their power and their control. So um, there is an urgency on their side to enter the, 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 the military arena before they lose the game on the purely uh, economic and international relations ground. So this is why we are part of uh, uh, Europe. I mean, the EU, the EU, the EU governments are part of a, of a power system that is very dangerous at the moment. And, um, and this brings us to Europe, um, we have established in, in DM. we say it openly, that we are a vassal of the United States, uh, foreign policy and other major, major decisions about uh, Europe are, are not taken by, by Europeans. Um, and this needs to change. Um, I should remind everyone that going into the EU elections next year, uh, a big DM motto and part of our um, policy narrative, which was actually voted just now in an all-member vote, is an independent Europe with independent citizens. And this kind of, you know, political, geopolitical independence is very important, both for us, but also to, to save the world, as it were. Because as, um, as US power recedes, what they're doing, and it's only natural, is they're cannibalizing on their closest allies. I mean, Europe has gained nothing from the war in Ukraine, from supporting Israel. At the same time, we're, we're expending people, resources, credibility, uh, our future. And, uh, and there's nothing in it for us. So the first duty of us as Europeans is really to fight for an independent Europe. And then, and also acknowledge our, 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 our 
are, are receding significance, like European population is what, 5 5 7% of the total. Um, economically, we used to be in a, a, on par with the US. Now we're like, what, 60% of that GDP. Um, acknowledge the crimes that Europeans have done in the past. And when and if we manage to become independent, we can also contribute to peace and, uh, and stability in this world. Thanks. Thank you, Anos. Um, we have a couple of more questions coming in from our chat. What can we, asks Doug from the US, common people do to help the progressive international movement achieve this reality that we are describing in this chat? And then a follow-up question. He's heard Yanis talk about doing general strikes against the likes of Amazon, for example, to give power to individual workers. Uh, but, he asks, won't the capitalists fight to the death to stop that kind of thing from being successful? How do we react to that? So those two more questions from Doug to keep in mind as we move on to Amir Kiai from The Hague in the Netherlands. Thank you, Eric. Uh, that last question was actually very interesting because, um, uh, and we know this also from the COVID pandemic, that uh, essential workers are... Um, the everyday um, nurses, teachers, educators, cleaners, collectors, garbage collectors, etc. Um, whereas the ones that you know we talked about, capitalists like bankers, are not really that essential. So there was a uh, some of you that are maybe have gone into the history of this. There's only been I think once ever in the history of strikes that bankers went on strike, and um, that I think lasted six months because they were not as essential as they thought they were. Uh, compared to, you can imagine if garbage collectors go on strike for you know for more than a day or two, and uh, you know people will react. Uh, when I was living in New York City, the garbage collectors went on strike for one day, and that was enough to get their demands met. Um, and in talks we had with uh, some of the unions um, through our uh, discussion that we have with them on conferences, etc. We sometimes discuss this idea of look if the you know the bathroom workers in the European Parliament go on strike, things can actually really change because that you know that's you know you're not going to see a parliamentarian uh, do the dirty work, and sometimes um, we are not using our labor power as as we should be, um, and that's maybe a, lo a bigger topic for discussion about the role that unions um, used to play and play at the moment um, and. Uh, and so on and so forth. So a bigger discussion, maybe I'm not going to open that up now um, and sort of stay on topic. Um, you know, look, for this, for tonight's talk, I was thinking about pre-1945 uh, and pre-this current global order. I was thinking of 1904. Uh, in 1904, um, the, the, the Herero people in Namibia rose up against the German occupiers and colonialists. What happened there um, was that the Germans, after they, after they rose up against the Germans, the Germans responded forcefully and drove hundreds of thousands of people into the Namibian desert. Um, they, where they died from thirst, uh, from dehydration and starvation. And the few that uh, were left were brought back and kept in the concentration camps um, where they died of disease abuse and exhaustion. Um, then the skulls of those people were sent to Germany uh, for further research to prove racial superiority. Um, in 1904, equally in the Congo, uh, if you worked in the rubber, if you were a slave in the rubber plantations and you did not meet your quota uh, of rubber, your family would be taken hostage and if you did not meet your quota the next day, they would chop the hands off and the legs of your family members. And this was in 1904. And unfortunately, we are maybe have modernized these mechanisms. We are no longer manually chopping off the hands on and feet of the people. But we see this every day in front of our eyes with what's going on in Gaza. And so, um, so some, sometimes I think we're not moving as fast as forward as we think we have in terms of progression. We've just maybe 
become more technologically superior in that sense. At the same time, there's been enormous progress, of course. We, we always talk about the enormous progress humanity has made through struggle, through action, through strikes, through coming out on the streets. Every single freedom we have today, the fact that we have annual leave, for example, if one is working, the fact that we have pensions, the fact that we have social security, the fact that we have some level of semblance of healthcare, maybe in uh, different levels, of course, in Europe and elsewhere, but we have it. Uh, the fact that we have an ambulance service, for example, the fact that we have a fire hydrant service, um, all those things are, uh, they came through struggle, people demanding it and struggling and uniting and organizing around and, and getting getting those things. It didn't just, it wasn't offered to them. It, the, the king didn't come and say, here, I'm going to be benevolent and give it to you. We're not going to see the same thing from Ursula von der Leyen and her, you know, explicit term for her team and so on. Um, what we see, for example, what Joseph Borrell did in an interview in Al Jazeera, he was asked, the, what do you think of Hamas's war crimes? He says, yes. What do you think of Israel's war crimes? He says, I'm not an international lawyer. And so this is the level of leadership that we have at the moment. And that's one of the targets we have is to force the resignations of these um, leaders, so-called leaders. And we have to say uh, enough is enough and get them out. And just to finish off, um, the last thing I want to say is that it means everything we have to do, we have to work across borders to bring an end to the impunity. And for example, this Friday, the M25 members are linking virtual arms with First Nations in South Africa. We will be protesting outside the Amazon offices in Amsterdam and our comrades in South Africa will also be protesting outside the Amazon offices in Cape Town. And it means breaking the fear barrier and speaking out against barbarism. And here I'm reminded by Irish Hefts and the countless others of Jewish faith who are, are being detained for saying not in our name. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amir, and thank you for mentioning the Make Amazon Pay campaign, which uh, Diem has been uh, helping push together with our sister organization, Progressive International around the world, uh, brings together over 80 organizations uh, and I think something like 400 parliamentarians from around the world uh, representing in total with those organizations, tens of thousands of uh, workers and uh, supporters to make uh, Amazon pay and uh, disturb not only the organization itself, but its entire supply chain around the world. Of course, make Amazon pay the Progressive International and DM 25 all independent um, organizations can only remain independent because they are financially independent, meaning that we only survive off the contributions and the donations that we receive from the people that support us. That means you. Uh, so another way that, of course, you can help is with a very vulgar, but of course, eternally necessary way of donating and helping us continue our work, uh, both in Europe and, of course, across the world. So with that, we move away from the Netherlands for the south to France and Grenoble, where Daphne Dalcara lives. Daphne, over to you. Hey, thanks, Eric, and uh, thanks, everyone. Um, just really <laughs> enjoying all the nice um, uh, vocalizations uh, that has been done until now and like feeling kind of pumped up on what Amir has been saying. And I think it's very interesting, not interesting, but important, let's say, to underline how essential it is to get out there any way you can. I think for too long, uh, the impunity that the ruling classes today are enjoying so shamelessly as uh, maybe never as more their hubris has been so visible to so many as it has been these last few days and uh, and i think uh, people are getting fed up and getting outside and uh this impunity that these the working classes uh, the ruling classes have enjoyed for so long i think is uh as a secondary effect has has had this uh apathy uh in the 99% that like these we can never, I mean, democracy is a farce and we could never, uh, we could never get a, 
get in front of this disaster uh, uh, that we're living through. But I guess uh, kind of going off on what's been said, it, like struggle and um, resistance is like, it's a muscle. And I it is true that we've stopped flexing these muscles as societies for a long time. And we flex, the more we flex them, the, the stronger and harder they will become. And we will learn. <laughs> Even though things might seem like impossible, not trying is defeat in the worst kind. While as uh, we will fail, we will fail better and better and better. We just have to continue to start moving these muscles and start learning our body again uh, as the 99% per se. So uh, I think that's very important. Um, on a separate note, I just wanted to uh, kind of touch upon uh, now a negative note, uh, a pessimistic note that how much I'm worried about like an increasing uh, transfer into like a militarization and like a war economy that we're headed towards. And it's, and this is coming in a time that never more have we needed more investment uh, in our societies. Uh, for climate change and everything. And it, this increasing escalation in conflicts and the arms sales that feed these conflicts should really, is so revolting that it should infuriate us all. Um, and I want to share a, a bit of a ironic anecdote, let's say, that today I was looking, um, uh, I saw that, uh, uh, Germany has pledged another 1.4 billion uh, euros in uh, uh, military aid to Ukraine. Uh, and then I was asking myself, how much has it been uh, in total now? And then, uh, I came across an interesting website saying Ukraine support tracker and Germany has now in total support over just over 20 billion. Uh, and ironies of ironies today, at the same time, German, German Supreme Court <laughs> has refused uh, to allow the German government to spend the 20 mil billion euros it had uh, put aside for, the climate, uh, for climate change uh, that would require uh, investments into uh, uh, storage uh, technologies and rail upgrade. <laughs> so it's almost like we're um kind of stuck in this hell where like the only expenditure we're allowed is for war <laughs> it's uh and i think a vast more and more people are becoming aware of this and yeah join us join others get out there guys uh thanks thank you for that uh, rallying cry daphne um if the absurdity of the political system that we live in isn't uh a rallying cry for action, I don't know what is. Let's go to my good Brussels neighbor, David Castro. David. Thanks, Eric. Um, <clears throat> really loved uh, what Daphne had to say there and also what Amir said before. Uh, I think it's really spot on, you know, only through struggle uh, can we win against the powerful. It seems like, I mean, against the powerful, right? Because when we, we, when we unite, we're actually more powerful than they are. Um, it seems like a cliche to say that, but it really isn't, you know, um, it's literally how it's always been and it isn't about to change. I don't think we have to go and reinvent the wheel there. I think that's literally how it, 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 we have to act going forward. That is the way. And, uh, you know, as Daphne mentioned, you know, impunity exists because there is no organized international struggle, you know, because who wants to struggle? I mean, it sounds difficult and tiring, but... If we're honest with ourselves, that's what we have to do. We have, we have to do it. There's no other way uh, around um, making that um, change to this horrible system, which I'm about to describe as well. Um, the democratic, our democratic systems across the world, they've been systematically disfigured, not by chance, but by deliberate design. This manipulation, which is, uh, has been orchestrated by power-hungry leaders, has distorted the very essence of our governance. Look around. I mean, the meteoric rise of the far right in Portugal just now, Austria, Italy, Argentina, you name it. 
and also the near victory in France last time around. They're, they're not random events. They are the symptoms of a democracy in peril. This alarming trend is the outcome of an archaic system, audacious for all the reasons, I would say. And I think we became entrapped in a kind of mirage of an ideal world rather than actually constructing it. Um, if you look around today, we, we inhabit a world, a facade really, where real conspiracies, not real, not mere theories, govern, govern our lives and suppress the many for the benefit of, of the few. Our current system deters us from questioning those in power, seducing us with the illusion of joining the elite if we simply work hard enough. Yet this relentless pursuit blinds us to the plight of those for whom such aspirations are not just unattainable, but quite honestly ludicrous. Our real battle lies in breaking free, I think, from this illusory state and remaining aware of the ongoing class struggle and linking arms internationally, which is precisely what Amir and Daphne and others have said. We must, we have to reject the deceptive narratives fed to us and fight for a democracy that truly represents the interests and well-being of all people, not just the privileged few. This is precisely why uh, it, this is the perfect time when the world is literally crumbling to join movements like ours, not just to make yourselves and ourselves feel better that we're doing something, but to actually do it. So if you haven't done it yet, uh, head over to our website, join us, get you know, get involved, be part of the struggle, because that's the only way we're going to transform this world. And it doesn't have to be uh, tiring all the time. It doesn't have to be uh, also uh, difficult every day. There's a lot to be gained from that. And, uh, you know, uh, human connection is, uh, is, at, is at the top of that. And uh, it's, you know, it's what we all need. So do join us, get involved, and let's do something because the world needs it. Thank you. Thank you, David. We're also pushing for a bit of happiness and joy and fun in the revolution. Um, let's go back now to Judith Meyer for one last intervention before we return to Yanis, who will wrap us up for tonight. Judith. I, I want to draw you, I think it's incredibly important uh, what uh, uh, David uh, just said. Uh, and and Daphne uh, about the need uh, to stand together in uh, internationally in order to affect this change and uh, I would bring you one example actually two examples um, which I believe uh, will become more and more uh, important um, uh, one is um, f uh, f from the Indian fight for independence uh, there was uh, this uh, uh, person, uh, Banerjee, who, who was uh, arrested by uh, uh, police as he was uh, demonstrating. Uh, and uh, somehow, I'm not sure, exactly sure, uh, his fate uh, became known uh, to a famous uh, Turkish po uh, poet, Nazim Hikmet, who wrote a whole uh, epic uh, about uh, this uh, Indian independence fighter. And then uh, from the uh, Turkish poem, we get a 70s Greek song, again, about this one person being arrested uh, on the street. And now imagine, this was before the internet. This was long before any kind of international um, kind of coordination. How did these people even hear about the injustice committed uh, by the British against a single protester? Um, it is unimaginable, but it does work. And this way, uh, Greeks nowadays still know this uh, song. It is one of the, uh, the known songs of the Greek left, uh, which is about the police arresting this one Indian guy, which came to Greece through Turkey, uh, through a famous Turkish poet. So it is quite fascinating. And something similar happened just a few years uh, ago with uh, Black Lives Matter. It was another such thing where there's just one person, just one injustice in another continent. And then the entire world starts demonstrating. So we just have to find these tipping points and we have to be organized in order to take advantage of them but it is possible especially now with all these uh, beautiful new possibilities that we have online uh, with the way the world is connected i believe that we can do it this is the time thank you judith uh, as a greek i'm not surprised that greeks know about it i'm more surprised that the german knows that the greeks know <laughs> it's uh, that that goes to further show i think the power um, of, of culture and of art in transmitting these messages. So with that beautiful message, let's head back to Athens and Yanis to wrap us up for tonight. Yes, um, I was very much taken by
Uh, India through Nazim hit the, the solidarity and before the internet. You see, I have a, a very weird theory about the internet. It has made no difference. Uh, we have exactly the same degree of communicating with one another, even though now we have these amazing tools. Because you see, these tools come with a lot of noise, which cancels out the signal. So in the end, I have this uh, homeostasis view that we have not gained anything in terms of the speed and efficiency with which we communicate across the world in the last 200 years. Um, I'm all in, in favor of the technologies, as you know, but I, because of the parallel increase in noise and signal, we are exactly where we were before, which is, in a sense, quite romantic. And, you know, it, it gives us a sense of continuity. The struggle continues. It doesn't matter how advanced our applications are and our phones. Um, we have to keep doing what people were doing 100 years ago. Uh, but this is not why I asked to, to, to take the floor again. It's something that Daphne said. Um, regarding, you know, Daphne, let me remind you, said quite correctly that um, uh, whereas the German government has pledged around 20 billion uh, to um, the war in Ukraine, uh, at the same time, the Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe in Germany uh, effectively struck off 20 billion from next year's federal budget in Germany uh, that was going to be spent on climate change. Well, let me. For once, for once, I'm going to, to, to side with the judges and point out a serious threat to democracy. You see, when the bourgeoisie, when the ruling class tries to use the law, and especially the constitution, which is a very powerful law, because you need two-thirds majority usually in order to overturn it, to change it, right? So you need a super majority to change. When the bourgeoisie uses the, consti cons the constitution in order to shrink the capacity of the electorate to channel resources to the needs of the many, to the needs of the planet, while at the very same time allowing for all sorts of resources to be thrown into the lap of the oligarchy, of warmongers, of the arms trade, and that's what you, you end up with. What happened in Germany is not that the Constitutional Court decided that, you know, you can spend money on war, but you cannot spend it on the green transition. No. It is the idiotic Social Democrats who, you know, 20 years ago, uh, in order to prove themselves more a royalist than the king, than the royal family, more austerian than the Christian Democrats, introduced a debt break in the Constitution of Germany. Effectively, they introduced limits on the deficits of countries, of countries, of the Federal Republic, that were put into the Constitution. Now, that is a stupid thing to do. The Social Democrats are the stupidest political force in the history of the planet. It's effectively like sawing off the branch of the tree on which you're standing. This is what they managed to do. Because you see, the thing is that if you if you impose a, a constitutional ban on a deficit, what is a deficit? A deficit is a subtraction. You take your tax take and you subtract from that your expenditure, right? And you say that that subtraction must yield, never yield a negative number. So you take an endogenous variable and you put it in the constitution. So, you know, then what happens is there has to be Violations of this, like when COVID happened, they suspended the debt break. But of course, and then they created um, shadow budgets for putting, you know, for expenditure which was necessary, but which was there in order to bypass the constitutional ban on having such bad budgets. When you start a process like that, who is going to be able to violate the constitutional controls? The military industrial complex. Not those who want to spend on climate, not those who, who want to spend on education, not those who want to spend on health. Time and again, in the last 50 years of what we call neoliberalism, it is the social democrats, the labor parties, 
that have managed to injure the capacity of social democrats to do, to carry out their program it was the australian government under the labor party which introduced fees in universities and then tony blair copied that in the united kingdom the result is the working class has no access to education anymore finished and who suffers from this the social democrats so yeah let's concentrate this is concentrates the mind of pro progressives about the use of constitutions in particular but the law in general and the institutions of the bourgeois state in order to ensure that the public the demos is not participating in the so-called democracy and that's what dm25 must fight tooth and nail against and do join us to do it join dm25 thank you very much yanis and uh i think as a wrap-up that things could be much worse than they are today and of course there is a much space for improvement is uh, as good a rallying cry as any I would like to take this opportunity to launch a fundraising campaign to connect Yanis to satellite internet. So go on Twitter and ha write hashtag Starlink. We have other financial priorities right now, like getting elected to the European Parliament. Let's direct that. But after June, after June, perhaps. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, your support is what keeps us going. Thank you to our panel for their contributions to this very challenging topic. And as always, we'll see you at our next meeting two weeks from now for another DM25 live stream. Until then, take care and see you then.